Welcome to What's Happening. I'm Michael Locke, Executive Director of the nonprofit Harwich Conservation Trust. And with me here today is author and historian Don Wilding. Welcome, Don. Thanks, Mike. Thank you for being here. Glad to be here. And we're excited to explore this guided walk, guided history walk partnership that we have between Harwich Conservation Trust and you and your research about Henry Beston, Cape Cod, and the Outermost House. Yeah, one of the great books ever written about Cape Cod. No Henry question. Beston being an author. Yeah, Henry Beston. This is an author that a lot of people, they don't know about. Uh, he was, uh, he wrote the book The Outermost House, which has been really, after all these years, it was written and uh, published in 1928. And the book actually went on, it was to become a really symbolic and a motivational source behind the creation of the Cape Cod National Seashore, really. Um, the book itself was said it was a lot of people refer to it as Walden by the Sea almost, but Walden uh, by Henry, Henry David, David Thoreau. Thoreau but uh, much with Beston, uh, I've always been a little more partial to Beston. I think a lot of people might know that who've talked to me. But uh, Beston's book, it's just the prose and how it captures the atmosphere of being on that outer beach. And what Henry Beston did was with Thoreau, he just kind of passed through. But Beston stayed here for, and, for really what was a year on the beach. And orient us, when you say on the beach or that reference to the great beach or the yeah. outer beach, what part of the Cape is that? That was in East Ham. In East Ham. East Ham at uh, Coast Guard Beach. And if you've ever been out there, you know the, uh, the beach there is a barrier beach. And it's changed a lot since Beston's day, quite a bit. Mm -hmm. uh, but back when Beston was out there, you had this barrier beach that stretched, fr stretched from the Coast Guard Station a good three or four miles to the south. That far south. At that point, because the inlet out there has moved quite a bit. Nosset Inlet. Nosset Inlet, going into the marsh. And so during all this time, there's been erosion and all kinds mm -hmm. of other differences uh, with with the, uh, with the coastal changes and everything. So with with the way the beach is now, it's all flat and everything, but... Uh, From washovers, wash storms, and and storms and everything. <clears throat> so it's been, a, it's been a gradual change, but it's been a dramatic change too uh, since then. And one of the big factors in that was the blizzard of 78 also, which everybody remembers that as a snowstorm, but uh, that ended up being uh, one of the probably one of the biggest and most uh, the, one of the most the biggest events weather events that we've had out here on the Cape. Our, our recent lifetime memories. Yeah really it, it really was uh, just over since even the 1920s when Beston was out there. Uh, <clears throat> That's when before we get to the intersect of the blizzard of 78 and Henry Beston's outermost house. Yeah. Tell us about that. The 1920s, a much different place. That's a hundred years ago. Yeah, it was. It, it it was so different out there at that time. There were there weren't that many people to begin with. I mean, I think there was about 500 people in East Ham at wow. that time. Now the year-round population is probably about 5,000. Mm. So uh, it was it was a very different world at that time when Beston came out there, and he was really not looking for anything in particular when he first came out here. He had actually, he was from Quincy. He's from Quincy. And he was a, uh, he had gone over to volunteer during the First World War as an ambulance driver, as uh, a lot of uh, other writers did, John Dos Passos, Ernest Hemingway. Uh, there's a, just a couple that come to mind of, uh, of writers that served in the ambulance service over in uh, France and Italy, as it was with Hemingway. But Beston went over to France, served as an ambulance driver over there, and saw just some of the most horrific things, mm. as you can well imagine. And he was in the middle of the Battle of Verdun uh, and some of the other really tragic battles. Mm. And he wasn't supposed to be originally, but by the time 
his service wore on, and this was only 10 months, he ended up being on the front lines. Wow, intense. And so he saw, he has very graphic details in some of, in this one book he wrote called A Volunteer Poilu, which was about his service as a ambulance driver. And he spoke fluent French, so this helped him out. But this was, when he came back from all of this, he was really, it didn't set in with him right away. But once he got home and back to regular life. Transitioning. It's yeah. a transition of it, but also it all started to come to him, the shock of it all. Because when you're serving and you're fighting a war, you don't really have a lot of time to reflect. You just survival. You have a, you, survival, mm -hmm. you have a job to do, and that's it. But once he got back and started to reflect on it, it really started to haunt him. It was almost like a PTSD uh, mm. uh, type of thing. And living on the beach, it was like the perfect, perfect thing for him. Um, and as he stayed there, he began to reflect on it, and he got more and more into the nature scene out there, and this was therapeutic for him. Na nature as healing, as therapeutic, as you say. Yeah, yeah, and that's what it did for Beston. Wow. And that's what the whole outermost house is about. And so he stayed in this outermost house. Yeah. He, describe he had, that to us. He actually, he, he had no idea of what he wanted to do. It was only going to be a writing retreat, this house. So he has the house built two miles south of the Coast Guard Station. He two hires miles a, south? Two miles to the and south. And the current beach is? Only about a mile. So that wow. just shows you how the much the inland change. has moved. Yes. And if you wanted to find that location now, it's underwater. Uh, underwater. It's yes. the sharks are swimming with it. Right. So it's uh, it, it's changed a lot. But he had no idea really what he was going to do other than have it as a writing retreat. He starts coming back more and more and more, and then he decides, I'm going to stay here uh, for a year. Well, his year was more like coming and going over the course of two and a half years and he finally weaves all of that into a book. I see. And that's how the book came about. And when he left the beach, as the story goes, he had been seeing um, the writer Elizabeth Coatsworth for many years, and she was from Hingham originally. And he came back and he wanted to get married after all this time. He's about 40 years old at this point. Yeah, during this writing journey yes. on the Outer Beach. Yeah, he's just, he's approaching 40. So he decides, he comes back, he wants to finally settle down. He th figured he had exercised his demons enough so that he could come back and live a real life. And he comes back and he asks Elizabeth to marry him, and she wanted to know what the, what the deal was. He had been gone all this time out on the beach and says, how come you don't have a, you have to have a book? He was a big believer in his writing skills. And he said, well, yeah, well, I've got a lot of notes, but and I'll get to it. Let's get married, you know. <laughs> and he it went back and forth, book, marriage, book, marriage. You oh, can, you interesting. Know, you can probably guess who won this argument. She said to him, as the story goes, if there's no book, there's no marriage. No kidding. And that was in September of 1927. The book, the manuscript was done by... Uh, uh, April of 1928. So it was sort of a motivational yes. thing for him. And then the book did come out in October of 1928. So it really was, uh, you know, he, it, it wasn't really planned out, right. the entire thing. He had no particular plan, he said. And once this all happened, voila, he came up with something that was resonated. Just, did it, how did it land at that time? It, it wasn't a big seller at first, mm. but it sold enough. Mm. It, sold, it even sold in the store in East Ham, as he referred to it, um, really well. And it gradually kept going, and then it got reprinted. It's never been out of print. Never been since, out of print since all it that came, time. All that time. From different from publishers. From 1928. It never has been out of print. That's a long run. It is a long run. It just shows you how successful that book has and how much of an impact it makes on people. And it influenced a lot of writers here on the Cape. It influenced John Hay and then Robert Finch down the line. Yes. Uh, it, it was very influential on a lot of people yeah. uh, over the years. And it also probably influenced, the biggest influence was on Rachel Carson. No Rachel kidding. Carson 
often said that uh, it was the only book to ever really that ever influenced her writing. So that just shows you how much of an impact, how important it was. And Rachel Carson, the author of Silent Spring, right, which drew attention to the effects of DDT on yep. ecosystems. Exactly. Yes. And that was a, uh, but she would point to that time and time again. The outer, the, how much the, the outermost book. house was important to her, and she became very good friends with the Bestons after uh, around the 1960s, uh, shortly before she died and before Henry died in 1968 as well. So it was, uh, yeah, it was a huge impact on on Carson and so many other writers. And then also, as you mentioned earlier, and describe a little more, it sounds like it had a powerful influence on the establishment of the Cape Cod National Seashore. Yeah, it did. Actually, when during the 50s, it, it started to, um, when the momentum built up again to have a national seashore. They first started talking about having a seashore back in the 1930s, and that would have extended all the way from Duxbury to Provincetown, was what they were thinking. But it never really got out of the gate at that point. So uh, over the years, and then the Depression happened, the war happened, mm. and the park system was in really tough shape uh, for a while there. But then it came back in the 50s, they sunk a lot of money into it, and they started to explore the possibility of maybe, well, let's build some more of these parks. And they, they'd been eyeing this area for a very long time. And when they started to make the case for this area, there were a lot of people who were working for uh, Senators Leverett Saltonstall and John F. Kennedy. And the people that were working for those two, plus Senator, I mean, uh, Congressman Hastings Keith, they were just some of the people that were involved in this. But when it came, these assistants who worked for uh, the senators, particularly for Saltonstall, you had Jonathan Moore, who uh, was well known out in the Orleans area. Yes. Uh, and Jonathan worked for Saltonstall, and he told me he used to use the outermost house to help make the case for, no kidding. for establishing that area as a uh, national seashore. So it, it was something that was constant. It, Salt and Stoll mentioned it too, he said. So whether Kennedy did, we don't know. Mm. But it, it's no question that it was used to help sell the concept of a national seashore. And Beston supported that whole thing himself. He used to write letters in support of it as well. So wow. it, it was what a vision. It really was. And mm. and you look at the uh, when you look at the book and read the book, it's really kind of a manual for the natural life of that of the Cape Cod National Seashore. And they used it in their reports. Oh, they referenced it. They in their actually reports referenced it several times. For the, the case for support for creating the National Seashore. Exactly. They used to push it that way and it really, really helped make the case uh, when they were pushing for the whole thing. Wow. So after, once it got signed into law, yes, there it was. And then a few years later, they recognized Beston's house as a uh, national literary landmark. It was kind of an unofficial distinction, but the First Lady of Massachusetts, Tony Peabody, was behind that. And so they ended up having a special ceremony at Coast Guard Beach, back when they had a big amphitheater out in mm -hmm. front there. And that's where they held the ceremony. There was anywhere between 200 or 2,000 people there. It depends on who you ask. <laughs> and it was really quite the ceremony. Uh, they had a lot of different people there. Uh, a young Robert Finch was in attendance that no day, kidding. as was Kurt Vonnegut. Kurt Vonnegut Kurt as Kurt well. Vonnegut and Beston were mutual fans of one another. So they used to always, uh, you know, compare a lot of notes about being in the war, but also they were just very fond of each other's work. And so Vonnegut wrote to him the next day, and saying, uh, "said your your park, is, your wife is lovely, your park is lovely." <laughs> is how he ended the letter. So it was uh, it was very had a big impact. That's that's an incredible story and history uh, of how Henry Beston and that outermost house experience weaves together with the establishment of the National Seashore. And so, as we wrap up here, uh, folks can join you on this walk yep. out uh, in the National Seashore in yes. East Ham, checking out the salt pond and the Nosset estuary views, uh, reflecting on the outermost house history and Henry Beston's work. Uh, I think it's 
Saturday, here it is, August 10th, mm -hmm. starting at 10 a.m. Yeah. And it's $15 per person. Folks can register online at harwichconservationtrust.org. Mm -hmm. uh, and then hear more about it, including that uh, the Blizzard of 78 and how that connected with Outermost House. And so they'll learn about it on the walk if they, if they reserve. So again, Saturday, August 10th, mm -hmm. 10 a.m., harwichconservationtrust.org is where folks register online. And then they'll receive driving directions with their confirmation email. Yeah. So we look forward to that walk. Thank you so much for your time today. Thank you. I look forward to it too. Thank you for joining. What's happening? We'll see you next time.